All right. Um, yeah, let's go get started. Um, so, uh, so yeah, welcome to our being of our third week here. Um, we um, are past kind of the kind of ideas for uh, learning Python and the scientific Python computing stack, right? So we're going to actually be beginning machine uh, learning in earnest starting this week, right? So, um, you know, if you're following along, hope everybody is, you should be reading the um, uh, the, the chapters from um, um, our hands-on machine learning textbook. Uh, there are additional things on here. Uh, um, I, I don't know if I've mentioned that Dr. Ng's uh, course before you should use uh, his uh, videos, kind of primary, some primary material. Uh, anyway, um, if you don't know, um, Dr. Ng is a very uh, well-known researcher in machine learning. He's at Google right now. He's been all over. I believe it's still Google. Uh, but anyway, he's, he's got some really good videos on machine learning. Um, so um, if you don't like some of the ones, I, I, I usually recommend people do those at least as supplementary, if not uh, kind of primarily, uh, especially once we get into you know, the details of things like linear regression and the machine methods and things. So, um, so um, I'm trying to remember just a second. Let me I bring that up real quickly. So um, I do have some videos. Uh, this is probably what I'm going to go through today and Thursday. I'll talk a little bit about the uh, the lecture notebooks that we had on um, the um, these unit three lecture notebooks, uh, which are basically all from the chapter two. Yeah, our textbook. So uh, most of the stuff this week is um, um, getting into some specifics of. You know, this, this is stuff that we don't often get in machine learning classes. We tend to concentrate on uh, building models and some of the theory and uh, things behind different models. Uh, but uh, really, from you know, from what I know of people, if you're interested in going out and getting a data, data analytics job or machine learning engineering job or something like that, uh, most most people in those positions will tell you that you spend 80, 90% of your time really doing stuff like exploration, cleaning, um, you know, the, 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 the training and tuning is, is a smaller portion. And then after that, you know, deployment. So if you're really working for a real business, you have to do a bunch of inf infrastructure DevOps stuff to actually deploy models to use them for, you know, uh, um, like a recommendation system on, on Netflix or Amazon or what, whatever, however you're deploying it, you know. So, so you know, it's understandable though. So in a class like this, we tend to concentrate on the, the specific parts which have to do with uh, how you actually build a model, uh, some data set, train it and test it and tuning and stuff like that. But there's a lot more to like a general data analytics, um, machine learning kind of position that you might get um, in an industry setting. So uh, anyway, so a little bit of that is what we're gonna be doing this week. Um, don't get started on assignment two yet. I made some changes, but I've got one or two more changes I'm gonna make on it. I probably won't get started talking about assignment two today, maybe start on Thursday, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, Assignment two, I gave, it's not even due next week. I think it's the week after that. That's what happened was the current due date uh, because I kind of jump you right into doing some things with linear and logistic regression. So we're actually going to do some things with scikit-learn um, and another library to do like linear regression before we really talk about linear regression. So we're not going to talk a little bit about the assignment stuff, uh, but I'm making some changes on it. So don't, don't get started on it yet. Um, but uh, but I gave a little bit of time on that because there's not a real good place or really good set of material that I wanted from chapter two or three. So, um, all right. So anyway, hope, hopefully, you know, you're keeping up with stuff. Um, I'm going to start off, you know, my goal today is to spend maybe half the time, less than half the time. Um, a little bit of a review on sign of one. Um, I did return back and I did post an example solution. Um, I waited till like this morning. I still had four or five people didn't submit something. You probably got a zero unless there's an excused reason why you didn't submit anything. So you have to get the stuff in on time. 
All right. So next assignment will be due like two weeks from this Friday or so. Make sure you get it done by Friday, 5 p.m. or whatever the due date is. Um, and I'm going to mention again, I hope this will be the last time I do it, but I had a couple of assignments. I didn't, I probably didn't catch everybody. If you didn't get caught, um, submitting work as a group or from uh, past solutions, you got lucky. Uh, those people got a zero. I'm, I'm going to keep track of those people. I'm going to get an F in the course and be referred to uh, the graduate school uh, academic ethics uh, if it happens a second time. So I hope it, hope it won anybody that was in this class, but um, at least five or six people, it was almost that many. Uh, there was something that was very explicitly um, with the same work being submitted on one or multiple ones of the questions. So zero for that um, and one strike at most. But, uh, but uh, yeah, hopefully I won't get other people doing it that I didn't see on the first one. Uh, if you were doing, doing it and got away with it, you know, way whether you want to be in the boat of getting a zero and possibly so so getting a zero means you probably can't get an a in the course on an assignment since they're worth about a letter grade is another <clears throat> consequence of that uh, okay like i said i don't like talking about that kind of stuff but it'd probably be the last time i do it uh, for the group um but um you know i will pull that trigger if i keep seeing issues with that um um okay Rest of this, I can probably talk in general. So there's a couple of points I wanted to make on assignment one. Um, there's an example solution. Most people were fine. Um, but um, I, I mean, I had some things about implementation here and there. Um, I'll just go through these one by one. So, you know, uh, you were given the inefficient version. Um, and if you ran this, I mean, hopefully people are, are running these codes and understanding this. Again, you know, the reason why I don't want people just using other people's work or working in groups is, you know, it's, it's, it should be very clear that people aren't actually running stuff and understanding stuff. They're just trying to get stuff in to get a grade and get past the class, right? Um, you know, if you actually ran this and understood what's going on, you know, typically if you ran the version that was using recursion of this first one, you know, so this is probably the upper end. My laptop's pretty good. I think I saw some people with less than that, two seconds or so. So that means that every time to call the function, it takes a couple seconds uh, for this inefficient version. Uh, a lot of people, you know, depending on your laptop, might take seven, eight, 10 seconds, right? Um, um, this is just a pet peeve, but, you know, again, you know, um, I asked people, uh, if you write a function in an assignment notebook, always have PyDoc function documentation, right? It's just a habit I want people to get into. It's, it's standard kind of thing for many languages. Um, so you need to have description, describe parameters, and describe return result. So I might have I mentioned that for a couple of people. Um, so, you know, there's certainly lots of ways. That, again, you know, people, uh, I know people, uh, it is possible to converge on a pretty similar solution independently, but but still, um, 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 it's more obvious than people students seem to realize when people are just directly using the same thing that somebody else has done or sharing a result. Here's one example of a solution. The 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 uh, main the important part of the solution is um, um, so. A lot of people had a solution that reversed this. So if n was in the fib dict, uh, in the dictionary, be, be careful my pronunciation here. So if n was in the dictionary or using for memoization, um, then they would churn the value. Otherwise, they did the work to create the value. The problem with that, that I mean, that works just fine. Um, my, my comment on that, if I didn't comment on you, and by the way, I also have 40 something students in here. I, Really, it, it takes me usually at least eight hours just to do it real quick and longer than that to bring these things. So I don't always get a chance to do as much feedback as I'd like to. Sorry about that. So that, that's one reason why I do post general solutions. You have to look at them on your own. If I give you feedback about, uh, and you didn't really understand it, about um, not really um, a very uh, uh, good looking way to do it. So if, if you check if it was in the dictionary and return it, and then you do the calculation and have another return statement, that works. Um, 
Um, it's nice. I mean, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's, uh, some people try to make it so you only ever have one insurance company function. Although other people don't like to, to try to force that because it, it tends to make your code sometimes be more complex than it needs to be. But here, some people were doing something. Um, I'll just retreat it a little bit. So, so if um, if it was in there, return it. Else, um, result equals fit with return. I'm not going to do this to make it work, but you know, calculate a result, but then also put like the return statement. Uh, did the work to say uh, this was a, a real egregious one. So some people did this, and again, you know, I was close to um, also flagging these people that that had basically this and and return called the recursively the function again. This isn't the correct name. Um, and I was actually surprised that this worked here because uh, maybe I should, uh, just to be clear here, make certain I'm not confusing by uh, using the right name for all this. Oops. Um, so at first I thought that this wouldn't work because I was afraid, um, but, but yeah, by, by putting the result in the dictionary, unnecessarily calling them recursion once again, but now when you call it again, it should be in the dictionary. So um, you should end up finding it and finally hitting the return there. Uh, so at best, that's annoyingly strange why you make that unnecessary recursion call. So another variation is basically this, but this is a little bit better. Right? Uh, but um, so that also works. Um, just looking at the code, you know, not the whole thing, just looking at the code from this point down. Um, and this is just, you know, again, kind of pet peeve structurally, you know, here, if, if you are going to return, you should return like in every one of your else blocks. So here, uh, this is potentially buggy dangerous because if, if somehow you don't hit this else, which it shouldn't be possible not to go to the else, because if you go to the if, you, you return. But if somebody adds another else if statement, they might add a logic that allows it to, to not assign something to result and then get to this code that expects the variable result to be defined. Right? So th again, this looks strange to me as a, I'll, I'll claim to be somewhat experienced uh, Python and regular programmer, right? So I mean, at a minimum, um, you probably should have at least put that so that uh, if a new else if block is added, uh, at least you would potentially use a bug or something. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, logically, uh, again, some people have this, hopefully you, hopefully the people that had this are pretty much like this, um, converged on this from your own thinking. Um, logically, what we're saying here in English is if it's not, if it hasn't already been calculated, calculated and now memorized, right? And then after that, you know, if it wasn't, already calculated, it has not been calculated as in the dictionary. So whether it was already calculated beforehand or we had to calculate then, after that point, we know that the value has been calculated and memorized. So I can just map, read the value out. That's probably, that's the simplest um, expression of the memorization idea, right? So I, I have something that, uh, Memorizes results whenever I calculate them. Every time I have to calculate something I haven't calculated before, you can remember that. And then I always check and look it up. Then, uh, if I've already calculated, I can just read it, return it immediately. If I haven't, I have to do the extra work to calculate. All right. So that's the kind of stuff. But this isn't really the point of the course. The the um, that Python textbook, Thick Python, talks a little bit about memorization. Hopefully, you read. Uh, in there. I think that's where I got this question from. Uh, just a common technique, uh, somewhat common in some areas. Another thing, you know, I mean, again, I can tell people really aren't running the notebooks. Uh, they're just copying stuff or just trying to get through them. 
So a lot of people didn't uh, actually change or show me running the efficient version. We either just copied the inefficient uh, and we're recalling the inefficient one. Um, you know, the, the big tell on that was, you know, you really should have seen this is this is many orders of magnitude faster. If you run the timing, it's taking nanoseconds rather than seconds, which is you know thousands, millions of times faster. Um, um, to execute it. So right away, if I didn't see you doing something in the nanosecond range, I, I went back and looked. You know, uh, did you either implement the 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 function wrong, or were you actually not running the function that you wrote, or something like that? Um, okay, I think that's all I can remember that I wanted to say about that. There were some other strange things. If you had a question, I mean, at least one or two people were, you know, um, obviously a bit lost or, you know, and I don't know what the issues are in that, not familiar with, with recursion or some other things, but, uh, but if you need to, if I had a comment about something like that, please come and see me so we can talk a little bit about some of those things. Um, Um, yeah, and as usual, you know, if you have questions about things, you know, stop me or slow me down. Uh, for part two, yes, um, because I was going so quick, might have been stuff that I normally might have taken points off on. So just because I didn't take any points off on these doesn't mean that maybe you were 100% on the, so it'd be good to review this. Um, I, I'm, I mostly was spot checking uh, and then jumping down the bottom, making certain that when you did the updates, that it looked like you got exactly the result of the same you should get for the the MZ and the um, uh, the T um, uh, arrays here. So uh, so what to say about this? Um, and in my solution here, I, I probably didn't describe it, but I show creating some value, some variables like columns and rows. If you look at this example solution, because that generalizes this so that when I, when I move these into the function, making that pretty picture, um, we can use the parameters um, instead of hard coding into some number of rows or columns, right? So um, that's, that's kind of the, the, the thing I was trying to get you to do if you're unfamiliar with these things is do kind of specific steps to create these arrays that look these particular ways and have these particular values in them. But then also just think about, okay, how do I generalize that to instead of an array of five and four, an array of uh, some arbitrary number of rows and columns um, in order to do these kinds of steps and do these updates. Um, so I, I think I already talked about this before this was due. So I was looking for something that was actually a row matrix, one row by five columns, um, maybe one person or two people um, uh, weren't here for that or um, didn't miss that, right? So uh, to, to, to get comfortable with using NumPy array, you really have to understand what you mean by multi dimensional array and, and the basic ideas of its shape, uh, number of dimensions and, and the shape, the number of items in each of the dimensions and how that kind of stuff works. A one by five row uh, is actually two dimensional, but there's just one row. Um, so that's a little bit different than a one dimensional vector with five elements in it. Um, and you may need a row matrix like this versus a vector to do certain calculations or do things in certain ways. So it can make a difference. Um, yeah, and the rest of these, I mean, I don't know, it's just shape or just a practice on doing things, you know. So Tiling function, I think I explicitly told you to use tile. Um, so, I mean, there would be other ways to create matrices with these particular uh, values and, and patterns like this. Um, um, and then, you know, the rest of this kind of, some, uh, then once we get into actually using the values, um, it's supposed to try to illustrate doing vector exploitation. So I didn't have anybody go off and start using loops um, on part two here, at least that I uh, that I caught in my quick scan through this, but some people did start, you know, so, so, so did use vectorized operations like 
just to add the two same shaped arrays here to get the result in Z uh, or to do the stuff talked about down here to find the um, um, absolute value and update things, right? If some people did it vectorized way here, but then uh, created some loops or nested loops um, in the, the function when it came to actually do the work, right? I took some points off that. So I'll just say uh, one very many people, but um, you know, in this class, if you're working with NumPy arrays, and you find yourself uh, writing a solution that iterates, uses a for loop or iterates over it, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, so for one thing, that is not um, uh, efficient. Your code will be much, much slower if you explicitly iterate over the calculated values rather than using NumPy uh, vectorized operations, right? It, it can, it, um, this should have been in, in your reading, but NumPy will call specialized matrix vector um, library written in Fortran C, uh, the glass library in, 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 algebra, in, in your algebra libraries thing, which means that uh, even though the code, Python is not known for being, you know, exceptionally um, fast, uh, having good performance, but NumPy can be almost as good as writing it down in C or Fortran. Because it's really, if you're using the vectorized operations, it is using those libraries. It's really kind of an interface, high level interface to using uh, high performance uh, vector matrix libraries. All right, so that's, that's, anyway, that's kind of the purpose of NumPy and we need that. So when you start doing machine learning and deep learning, if you're not using the libraries correctly, you won't be able to train your thing, your 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 models in reasonable time. It'll take forever instead of taking uh, hours or minutes. Um, all right. So uh, the other thing I'll mention, you know, so if you were using like where or which, you can get it to work. But I still think that that's not as clean as just directly using Boolean indexing, right? So you might want to look at the solution if you were using a different way to select the values um, of the NumPy arrays, right? So, you know, at its simplest, uh, it can look something like that, right? So if I only want to affect the particular values that were true in the mass, um, I can read them out using that mass. So this array of Boolean is the same size as these, so only those values will come out and be squared, and only those corresponding values from C will come out and be added. And then those values that were selected by selecting on the left-hand side will only be assigning or updating those values. Right? So to me, I mean, that's a much cleaner way to write than to use like an umpy functions to uh, um, uh, select values based on a Boolean array or some other method. As long as it worked, you're fine here um, or in here. Um, all right, questions? So, you know, th this was the part two was meant to lead you into, you need to do, do the same things. So some common things here, again, you know, um, I gave you the documentation, but uh, if you ever write a function or I don't give it to you, or if I do get to you, I always include the things. Uh, some people, I, 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 I should have, this is one thing that I consider very bad. Uh, I might have missed some people, but you know, you really need to use the parameter. You need to, to learn the basics of what it means to write a function and use a function. So if I'm passing in values for C and num it, you should use them. So I caught at least two people, you know, so the, the parameter C, which is supposed to be the values that get put into your array C that you tile. Um, so here, again, lots of people use lots of different methods um, for initializing C, M, and T. Um, simplest, like the full method uh, will create something of a given shape uh, and will fill it, will initialize it with the value there, right? So that's all I'm doing for uh, the first two. Uh, C has the same shape as Z, it gets initialized to the parameter, right? So if you hard coded this to those values instead of using C, it works for the code I gave down here. But if I tried to, to create a different 
the fractal was really it would be given a different scene, it wouldn't work. You still didn't have it in the same fractal. Does that make sense? So, you know, learn the basics of a function, right? So if we're given parameters, uh, you should be using those parameters. It's, it's almost always a mistake to have parameters as a function and not be using them. I and mean, why would you pass something in as input if you don't actually use it as a function? Right. Um, same for num iterations, although, I mean, most people did that, use number of iterations. So yeah, lots of ways you can initialize these. These are particularly clean ways. So there are functions besides full. Uh, and then, you know, and if, if you were doing this in earnest, you know, it, it takes time to discover these things. I don't expect, you know, so as soon as you find a solution, that's fine. But by looking at code like this, you're looking at the, keep looking at stuff like this, you'll find other ways of doing stuff that will be better, cleaner um, to do things, right? So there are lots of functions uh, in NumPy for, generating arrays to, to start with besides zeros and ones um, for doing other things. So you create empty arrays, create arrays filled with initial values, create arrays, uh, special, special properties like only um, um, uh, uh, have diagonal arrays and there's lots of other things. So, um, it takes time to discover those things. And, and it takes looking at lots of other people doing code uh, discover um, features like that that are made you know, for, for specific purposes. Um, oh, um, another thing, again, I maybe I didn't catch this for everybody, but um, I should probably, should probably make the description clearer for this um, problem. Um, um, so here, if you're using the Z that's passed in, uh, the problem is, is that uh, if, if you do the, the, the function as described, you need to update C. So you're actually modifying C. Now, in many programming languages, when you pass in values, uh, they're going to get passed in by value instead of by reference as a parameter. But you know, one thing to know about Python um, is that uh, uh, arrays are usually going to be passed by reference. Again, this is an efficiency or performance thing, because if I pass my value, that would imply that every time I, I want to pass something, I can copy all the values into a new place before I can pass it by value. So in, in arrays that we do with machine learning, might have millions or billions of rows. It might be really big. It might be taking up gigabytes of memory. You make a copy of that, it's going to take a long time, or it might even you know uh, 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 blow your memory. You might run out of memory doing stuff like that right so if you don't if you're not following me something like this um um if you have x here um at uh, a range or lin space so, so if you have an array so x is just going to be a regular vector of um of um, shape five, one dimensional vector, right? Uh, now, so if you do something like this, um, it's not really making a um, copy here. So um, uh, by default, um, it's really making a new reference. So this is different to most data types in Python. Uh, we'll make copies and then do assignments like that, not NumPy arrays, right? So, yeah, what it means then effectively is these are different views of the same thing. Um, this should have been covered in somewhere in some of the lecture notebooks that you should have gone through here. So, If I change something in X, since they're both views in the same thing, that's annoying. Uh, it will actually affect both of them since they're both referencing the same thing. So back to this, uh, again, you know, maybe it didn't catch everybody, uh, but uh, I meant that for a reason. So normally if you do pass something in like this, uh, I probably don't want my Z to be clobbered uh, after I call the function normally uh, as a side effect 
of of calculating the Julia fractional here. So um, what you have to do with NumPy arrays, if you're in that situation, is you have to explicitly force it to make a copy. Or the copy function is necessary to avoid that uh, in this case here. Um, so yeah, it was insufficient to just say you know, Z copy equals Z, right? You would still be having the problem. They'd both be just viewed in the same thing if you did that. Um, all right, yeah, so I don't know if I have what else. Um, I mean, some people were still using like date times for these. I talked about that. Uh, you still get a, a fractal that uh, looks uh, probably looks the same, uh, unless you like zoom in on it or something. Um, but uh, but yeah, what I'm really looking for is, um, I mean, the time just the, the iteration number, um, is sufficient. Um, there, um, um, but yeah, d using the uh, another thing. I don't think I took points off for this, but a lot of people were initializing m uh, uh, to start off with to be the values that were greater than two instead of initializing everything to be true. So, um, so technically, your fractal images might actually be slightly different from the one that that I'm getting here, where I where initial, everything starts off as true, uh, but visually you might not be able to tell the difference. I think I kind of skipped over that, but. Um, um, but, but yeah, I mean, right. I really wanted like um, 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 the mask to be a Boolean mask that, uh, didn't I specify that explicitly? Hmm. Okay, well. Well, maybe I didn't even state it, so maybe I shouldn't take off points anyway. But um, if you did it, like first step for problem two, you should start off everything true, and then you start your I, I don't know if you know this isn't really again this isn't really the point in the class. It's a pretty fractal picture, but basically what's happening on this is that um, as we do this calculation over the complex numbers, um, uh, more and more things drop out of having an absolute value greater than two when you square them and and re-add in the C there, All right? So what, really what's happening with the color here is the black color represents things that were less, the absolute value was less than two at time zero. The things that get brighter and brighter, they remained uh, less than or greater than, you know, uh, they remain true uh, for this test uh, all the way up to iteration 256. Okay. Um, and uh, because of this, squared calculation, you get what's commonly thought of as a fractal type of pattern. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's really all we're, we're returning is those timestamps, which should be like 0, 1, 2, up to 255. Um, so that's going to be the time when those became less than that absolute value, less than that threshold. Um, all right, Any, um, I think that was all the points I can remember for stuff I wanted to um, bring up different things that I'd seen people doing on that. Um, all right, so anyway, you know, these, I mean, you, we will be using NumPy a lot. So, so these two questions are important. Um, if you're not comfortable yet with NumPy, um, go back and review this. So this will help at least a little bit with some of the things we'll be using a lot. So vectorized operations, uh, fancy indexing, Boolean indexing, um, NumPy arrays in general, how they work, uh, ideas like shape, dimensions, things like that. All right, let's move on. And then for uh, also, you know, pandas is very useful for machine learning and data science data analytics tasks. So it's, it's the standard. I, I think I've already mentioned the history of this. So if you ever learn R, the R programming language or know it already, R is, is was a language developed basically for doing data analytics. Uh, one of the fundamental things of R is, is a data frame. 
the Panda's library was added to give a data frame that works functionally about the same as the data frame in R. So you give some more ideas. But but you know the, the main concept um, is a, a table. So in this class, pretty much everything, every kind of machine learning data analytics task that we do, we're going to be just using a tabular kind of format. Although a rich table like a data frame, because the, the columns are going to represent measurements of features that um, um, we're going to use to build a model of. Um, oh, uh, yeah, so another one, I don't know if it was fair of me to take out points on this or not, but um, I don't remember if I mentioned this, but um, do use relative path names. So again, uh, because I've got so many people, I do uh, at least some of the grading using auto grading kinds of thing. I have a script that runs through and checks basic things. Does it actually run uh, all the cells cleanly? Um, some other stuff. So your cell won't run if you don't if you don't use the, the location of the data file. So definitely this is wrong. You give me a path name on that. There's no way it's going to be valid in my environment where I'm running the code because I don't have the same username. Right? I mean, all, you should almost never use absolute paths in notebooks like this. I mean, the, the way projects are structured, and this is another thing where that, this is the general thing of doing data, data analytics kind of projects or other things like that. You know, the way projects are structured is things are always going to be relative to the root of the project directory, uh, to, to the top of the project directory, right? So you shouldn't do that. Uh, you shouldn't even do, even if you're using the vagrant environment, and so never use an absolute path. Um, you also shouldn't copy the data files. So if you expect the data file to be in your current, the same location where the um, where the, um, the the notebook is, uh, this won't run either when I run the auto grade on it. The, 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 the CSV file, the data files aren't in the same directory where the assignments are. Right? So what I mean by that, you know, if you look at our directory structure, Assignments are in the assignment subdirectory, data files are in the data subdirectory. So then you should learn and understand what we mean by specified relative path. So all assignments are expected to be run where its current directory is assignments. That means that all data is loaded one level up in the subdirectory called data. You always use relative paths whenever you're doing stuff inside of a project, um, uh, in, in, inside of the directory structure of a project. Um, anyway, I, I probably took a point off for that this time. Um, I mean, I'm being a little bit harsh, hard here. I know it's a small thing, but um, you know, I got so many people, um, you know, it takes me an extra five, 10 minutes to go and correct that if your notebook isn't running. I'm just not going to do it. You know, and, and I, I maybe I, if I'm feeling good, I might grade everything that happened before it stopped. But I probably won't go any further. Um, all right. Um, oh yeah, and maybe one uh, another general comment to think about stuff here. So I had a couple. I don't know if there's too many. And some people, though, were using integer indexes for the columns to access stuff instead of using the, the column names, the feature names. Um, again, you know, if you're doing that, you know, you can get it to work, uh, but you're doing something wrong, probably. I mean, there are some contexts where you really do need to use integer indexes of the, of the data frame. Um, I mean, you know, if you have a NumPy array instead of a data frame, you have to use integer indexes. If I want to. Uh, select columns by index number. Um, but for a data frame, you're probably doing it wrong. You know, it's 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 meant you're meant to be using the the names of the features, the, the, the column names, in order to make your code more readable to do the processing. So then you know, we we'll talk a little bit about this when we discuss the um uh, the the uh, the pandas um uh, lecture notebook, right? So I mean you could either if I only need a single column, uh, you can use a member variable. Uh, so there'll be a member variable with the same name as every column name. 
That's what the right hand side is on this example here, January, February, March is actually accessing the series uh, of those named columns. Or um, you can also use the square brackets, but give strings access by column. So this, this makes your code more readable. Uh, it also makes it invariant to um, the ordering of the features. Right? If somebody goes in and sorts the columns or changes things around, this will always refer to that column that's named total, that, that column is named Jan, January, in here. Um, And um, uh, today, maybe I'll we'll probably talk a little bit more if we've done the readings for this week yet. Um, you know, so things about missing values and stuff. So again, we probably don't spend as much time as we should in this course, but you know, how you handle malformed data or missing data or bad data is a large portion. If you ever do get like a machine learning or data analytics job, spend a lot of time on that kind of stuff, then you will building models and things. So. Uh, but yeah, there was a little bit of that in this first problem here where there were a few things that were missing. I don't, I don't know if these are the best way, but there are various ways you can figure out which things are missing or how many things are missing for a particular feature or over the data frame total. Um, Um, oh, I have to take some time. I have to rerun those uh, timing things. Um, Sorry, just give me a second here. Um, I just have thought about. Uh, just rearranging stuff, but yeah, you know, it always takes a little bit of time to um, uh, redo the uh, formats for the inefficient version there. We're using the bigger environment. Um, I don't know. While I'm waiting on stuff. A couple of nice features. Um, yeah, when things are running, if you're running a really long notebook, um, the uh, the table of contents stuff. Uh, if you've set that up correctly, you know you, it'll also give you indications of where it is running stuff in the in the notebook. There, I'm not going to rerun it, but um, something that could be nice in order to figure out uh, where things are. Um, So um, I, I was going to say, uh, my example, example solution is kind of a do what I say, not what I do. So uh, using the location there, but yeah, simpler way is just, uh, you know, since you can pass in columns, the default is if you give a list of strings, select out the columns, um, like the, the three there, if you want. Um, but uh, Maybe I did that because I'm not certain if this works to um, So I want to select out those four columns, but then plot. I think most people did this again, I might I might have you know you might have got lucky. I might have missed this off. but I, I wanted people to uh, not use the map plot lib, although we could have used that plot lib. It'll be the same plotting time. But uh, the, the, the plotting stuff in um, Pandas data frames, um, so the, the data frame objects support plots of different kinds. These are meant to be uh, really kind of quick when you're doing data exploration, if I want to make quick plots and stuff. So it's good to learn some of the basics of, of the things you can do with the data frame plots. Um, um, I mean, you can do the equivalence of matplotlib, but this will, if I just need a quick plot to visualize something, in the data frame, I can often do it uh, a lot quicker. Just pull up the, the thing there. Yeah, I, I probably must have did that because uh, I guess I can't call um, 
uh, plot there uh, the way I have that. Uh, oh no, wait a minute. Oh, that works. Yeah, should fix that. So probably it looks better if you can. It's best not to it's not to avoid the low and the high low unless there's some special reason that you need those. Usually, it'll make your data frame code a bit more readable. Um, all right. Um, I didn't really give that extra credit, even though I said that there. Um, so I kind of went back on that. I didn't take off points, but I didn't, uh, I didn't add an extra point on that one. Um, all right. I think I can't think of anything else. Is that uh, anybody have any kind of questions or anything before I move on from the assignment? Um, um, anyway, so you know, those are some things I hope that uh, that uh, that you thought of that I wanted people to think of for doing this assignment um, and uh, you know, some, some stuff to understand. So, um, all right, how are we doing? So yeah, let's go ahead then and start talking about our new stuff here. So um, there are the main stuff that I was looking for for this week. We are past using the Python stuff. So like I said, uh, if it wasn't clear in the uh, directory structure under lectures, there's a couple of sub sub directories. So all the stuff for the hands-on machine learning textbook uh, that I've done is actually in there. Um, there's, I don't know if I'm giving away anything, but uh, there is actually a official repository for the hands-on machine learning. So sometimes um, I use the the notebooks from there, or I start with those. So the notebooks I have here uh, will sometimes be similar to the official ones that you get. Sometimes though they're not. Uh, I add stuff or, or uh, uh, create different different new examples. So, uh, but yeah, if I didn't have one for a chapter uh, yet in here, you can get. The, the notebook from the official one, if you don't want to type in all the code examples from like a chapter, if, if you are reading along with the hands-on machine learning textbook, which I hope you are. So um, um, hopefully I have a link to that. I'll have to should check that. Um, but uh, the textbook, hands-on machine learning textbook should have a link at the preface of uh, you know, an indication of the GitHub repository where they have all their notebooks. So, um, so, oh, it looks like I might have these named differently than what I when I said though. So, um, so yeah, sorry about that. Um, sometimes I don't get everything um, um, updated. Um, Uh, but we are talking about these first three. Um, so th this is chapter two. So I need to. I think I need to update the uh, the, the course content. So I, I changed it at some point to just be the the chapter number that these are coming from. So these are chapter two from our textbook, um, um, which is an interesting chapter. I'm gonna bring up that textbook real quickly here. So. Um, I've, hopefully I've mentioned this before, but um, I am using third edition, so um, which came out just like uh, less than a year ago. So um, I don't think the chapter numbers change, but maybe, I, and I don't usually use page numbers, but um, um, if I give a page number, it's probably referring to this edition. Um, but but uh, edition two is probably fine if that's the version that you got. Shouldn't be too much changes on that. Uh, so yeah, the stuff we're going to talk about the rest of the day and um, on uh, Thursday a bit uh, is really kind of big picture stuff. So this is kind of taking a step back before we dive into uh, the specifics of machine learning uh, models, um, classification, and, and, and regression tasks, and the other specific um, 
models that we'll look at. Um, so, um, um, so this is a good checklist. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, uh, I, I, I like this textbook a lot. Um, um, one reason I like it is it, it does have a lot of practical stuff. So again, if you're interested in uh, industry or career in data analytics and machine learning, there's lots of practical things in here as well as theoretical stuff, right? So a good one is example of this is, is some ideas of a big picture of the steps you would do for a typ typical uh, uh, machine learning project or data analysis. So there's a lot of overlap between those. I'll tend to use that interchangeably, although somebody who's a has a data analytics title might uh, take some exception with me being so free with uh, kind of equating a machine learning engineer to like a data analytics person. Um, but uh, there's also, um, um, if you look at the appendices, uh, I like the appendix A with a um, couple more kind of practical ideas of, of things that you do have to do like a project in this area of, of kind of steps and things um, you might want to think about. So anyway, um, so final thing before I'll switch back to the, the lecture notebooks here, but um, um, so yeah, this is really giving a little bit of talk about some stuff that we won't talk about again in this, this class, even though it is important to this kind of area. So, you know, things like uh, getting the data, doing data exploration, uh, preparing the data, you know, so a lot of the assignments we give in the class, you know, all the data will already be cleaned and prepared and missing values uh, corrected for you, that kind of stuff. But in the real world, you have to do a lot of stuff before you're ready to begin thinking about, you know, how am I going to model this and uh, train a model um, to, to do predictions on the data. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's, uh, it's chapter two, but I, but uh, there's actually three notebooks um, uh, that get got broken into. Um, so, Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of stuff in here that I wanted to discuss or mention uh, things about, although there's going to be a lot of overlap with this and the, uh, the lecture video that I already have, so we're using the same notebooks in those lecture videos. Um, but but uh, lots, lots of good examples in here. So um, um, uh, in, in the chapter two from um, our textbook, uh, he uses a um, um, data set that has information about um, uh, uh, house pricing data in California. Um, so uh, although it's not directly, so it's not pr prices of single houses, it's really the price of houses uh, in uh, areas in California, okay? Um, so, I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna run these cells one by one. So, um, um, oh, by the way, you know, I'm thinking, you know, to your assignments, um, usually uh, I will try to, in, in the, the files I give to do the assignments, I will try to give all the imports that you need um, to, at the top. Um, um, if you if you want to use something that wasn't imported in the file that I give you for the assignment, you might want to ask me first. In general, we're mostly only going to be using NumPy, Matplotlib, uh, and Pandas, and Scikit-Learn. Um, uh, um, I don't know. Well, we do use Scikit-Learn here in Chapter Two, I believe, uh, but we're, we import those specifically when we use them, so you can see the imports um, here in this Chapter Two. Uh, another general thing, though, um, it's usually not a good idea in the assignments to have imports uh, scattered through your notebook. So if you do check with me and, and, and you think you need to or you would like to import something else um, and I say it's okay, I should probably put it up at the, the top instead of having it 
I scattered anything in the notebook. Um, but most lecture notebooks, um, um, uh, um, I will often uh, scatter the imports in there, but that's mostly because we're talking about the thing that we're importing. Um, so we want to see the example there. But, but normally when you do work, uh, like a machine learning project, you just put all everything you need import right up front um, and then use it at the rest of the notebook. Um, um, So yeah, this data set is relatively large. So uh, I guess I don't have it in the repository by default. You have to actually download it. So uh, hopefully I rerun this. Uh, not, not all this code comes from the textbook. So it was nothing I believe that was, um, um, so right. Just writes a function here that uh, uh, in this case, I might've modified a little bit to make certain that it goes into the, uh, the, the data directory here. Oh, notice. Notice the relative path that we're using here because this notebook I'm running is not in the assignment or it's not in the lectures notebook. It's in a sub notebook of lectures. It's in lectures HLML, right? So if I want to access data from here, when I'm writing this notebook, I have to go up two levels before I get to the location where the data notebook is, right? So that's why the relative path is uh, two levels up um, in this notebook here. Um, so hopefully I didn't make a mistake there. This won't take too long to download. I mean, it's uh, there's a couple of thousand, but it's, it's yeah, it's not really that big. So it's less than a megabyte, you know, four hundred thousand bytes. Um. So here, when we load the housing data. Um, so no, I mean, all we're doing is doing a read CSV, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, so it's always good to, you know, I mean, don't, don't skip over this. You know, when, when I give you data files for the assignments, it's good to look at kind of the raw um, thing. So now that we download it, we should have that if you, if you run this on your own system. So if we go back and look at our data. Hopefully it's in there now. So we got all these CSVs for the assignments, but uh, we got the um, housing. Yeah. So, um, oh, boy. oh uh, yeah, this, this thing doesn't redo the download if it's already there. So, um, although, yeah, I would have thought it, would, I thought it wouldn't, wouldn't have been that long ago that I did it. But anyway, um, uh, you can't open, you know, in the, the Jupyter Notebooks. Um, you can't open up CSV files, um, although sometimes it hides some things from here. So you really need to see the complete raw stuff. Uh, you might need to go to like the command line or use a better editor, um, a VI or some text based editor, Notepad plus plus or something. Um, so uh, it might be a little bit too, maybe I shouldn't have done that. So it is like half a gigabyte. Let me look at that data file here. Uh, uh, so it's like 1.4 megabytes uh, uh, in, in size there. Um, that shouldn't have been too bad, although I'm a little bit surprised it's going to take some time there. So uh, anyway, so, yeah, I'm, I'm ramping up. We're, we're talking about data exploration here, right? So it's, um, you should probably, especially for a new data set you've never worked with before, at least open up once. In a raw plain text editor, take a look at it. Uh, if you just try and read it in, you know, using some read function into, into a data frame or into a spreadsheet or whatever, it might be doing stuff that you don't realize or don't understand. Right? Um, here, you know, I can't really completely see that the the raw stuff because um, uh, this viewer in Jupyter Hub. Um, assumes that the first line is column labels, column names. Those may or may not be there in a real data file here. But uh, but yeah, in this data file, um, the first line is actually the names of the features that we're going to use. It's, it's just a table. I mean, all of our data, uh, um, all of the data that we're going to use for this class will pretty much be laid out as tables. Um, so we've got 
information about uh, the location. It's really the location of the region, not of the house. Um, so yeah, if you didn't understand that, it wouldn't, you know, be, these different features might make sense. So uh, this is the number of rooms of, of all the houses in that region, I believe, if I remember right. Uh, number of bedrooms. So yeah, we don't have one house with 880 rooms. We've got some number of houses. Uh, we've got 126 houses, I think. Um, with that total number of rooms, uh, like on this first region here, um, that that number of bedrooms. Um, so just a little over one bedroom per house uh, in this region. Um, the number of people in that region. Um, and um, we've got some other information like. Um, um, so, oh, uh, yeah, I'm skipping a little bit, but this example from chapter two is basically trying to build a model that can predict what the average house price is in the regions based on these features as, as input that we're going to use to train and build a model, right? Which a common kind of thing. So, uh, lots of of companies or websites that deal with real estate, you might want to be able to predict housing prices based on location and size and how old the house is. And um, so um, um, here, right, the, you know, this is kind of important for the predictions. It gives, it gives a, uh, this is an example of a categorical piece of data. So in the, in the raw data, it's really just a string but there's there's only like a, a couple of discrete number of categories like near bay near bay inland um, uh, near the ocean and so on right so categorical data is very uh, common in, um, in data analytics right uh, so one way you can encode categorical data is like it's just as a string right but if I want to build a model using that categorical data uh, so things like scikit learn can't use strings. It needs numbers. So I need to convert that categorical data into some other numerical representation, right? uh, which is one thing that's kind of shown in this chapter two here. So a simple thing is I could just uh, figure out how many different categories I have and assign an integer value to each one. One for near ocean, two for less than one hour from ocean, and so on. Um, uh, we don't actually have like a location name, but there is latitude and longitude. So you see there's a little bit of, of some impressive visualization uh, done in, in chapter two. Uh, but yeah, we can use this latitude and longitude to actually visualize the location of where uh, this housing data is in, in this data set. Um, and um, oh yeah, we said it was like about 500,000 bytes, although it ended up being 1.4 megabytes on my hard drive. Uh, but there's really only, it's, it's not it's not really a big data set. Nowadays, big data set. You're not talking millions of rows, millions of um, items in your data set. Uh, you're not even approaching to what people would consider big data nowadays. So this only has 20,000 20, plus um, uh, regions, which is 20,000 plus rows in the data set here. All right. Um, uh, age, although again, you know, since it's not a single house, this is the average. Actually, it's not the average. I don't know if uh, it would be useful to know some basic statistics. So there's a difference between the, the mean and the median. This is actually the median uh, age of houses uh, in each measured district here in California. Um, all right, anyway, so that's the raw data set. I'm gonna close that off, hopefully I won't need that again. So if we load that into a data frame, um, um, so this load function, you know, is just using pandas to load into a data frame. Um, uh, I didn't count up the columns, but now, you know, look at the raw data, we saw in that view, uh, there was 20,000 plus, um, so we got 20,000 uh, rows. 20,000 uh, different items, uh, regions in our data set here. There's actually 10 columns that came out of here. I didn't count them up, but there must have been uh, 10 separate columns or features uh, here. Um, 
some of this is just uh, examples, right? So, um, you know, again, I wouldn't normally, wouldn't be a good idea to get things by column number, but if I want to get the fifth column, oh, I'm sorry, no, it's the other way. So this gives me the fifth row. Say, so the, the fifth item uh, in our uh, fifth region in our data set have these values, um, near bay, uh, median house value of 269,700. That's, oh, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm skipping ahead here, uh, but in this data set, that's what we want to predict. Okay, so this is typical when we're doing what's known as a regression problem, which is what this problem is going to be here. Uh, we, we've got the thing that we'd like to predict. So if we have a region that we don't have data for, I'd like to predict what the median house value is. So I'm going to build a model from the data that I have, or actually from some of the data that I have, using these other features as inputs to the model to try and predict what the house value would be in that region, given a region that's a particular location, that has houses of this age, that has a population of this size, that has this particular category and where it's located in relationship to the ocean and top one and All those things we can use as inputs to try to build a good model to make predictions. Um, I think these, most all this probably just came from chapter two. These, these are examples of using uh, data frames in different ways um, to, to index. You know, so the first five columns get the, um, the third row, which was, um, Total rooms, maybe. All right. So again, this is kind of a do what I say, not what I do. Probably not a good idea to be using the column number here. I don't know exactly which uh, feature it was that we were extracting out of there without counting in here. Um, so yeah, moving ahead on the uh, the, the chapter two here. Oh, well, there's more time already. Um, so since the thing we want to make a model of to, to predict things about is the, the median house value. One thing we need to do with this data set is actually extract that column, that feature, because we need that in a separate array, a separate uh, vector, uh, because those are going to be the things that we make predictions on. So um, those go by uh, lots of different names. So we can think of those as the labels that we want to predict in this data set. Uh, and then in this data set, um, our you know our value since it's a uh, since it's a number that can have any value from probably like you know, ten thousand dollars to some of the cheapest medium locations here, stuff like that. So that's something I think we find out when we do some data exploration. You know, what's what's the the cheapest and the most expensive median house uh, that we have in regions and like that. But yeah, I mean the 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 thing the label we're trying to predict. Can be any value from I don't know, probably like ten thousand to a million or a couple of million, maybe in some of the more expensive regions. Um, so since we're not trying to predict like uh, like a category, right? So uh, I'm I'm giving you a preview. Of something. There's two main kinds of machine learning problems we're going to do in this class. One called regression and one called categorization. This is an example of regression where we're trying to predict something that can essentially be any value in a big range. If we were trying to predict something like, uh, like you try to make a, a, a spam email filter or spam classifier, you have an email input and you want to classify it as spam or not spam. Right? That kind of categorization where there's, you try to predict like two or some discrete number of labels, that's a categorization problem. So we'll talk a lot about that. Those are the main two things. Um, so, but here we're going to be doing, a regression um, model here. Um, so yeah, if, if you look at after extracting this, we've got you know the same number of labels as we had rows, right? So that's the median house value labels for every one of our regions in our data set at this point. Um, yeah, I'll probably, probably only go through the rest of this first notebook. We'll leave the other two notebooks for next time. So the, the next step in here is doing a little bit of um, um, visualizing. So doing some data exploration. Right? So in a real data analytics task, 
before you can really do anything, you have to understand the data, right? So that, that's really what exploration is all about. Um, so, you know, after we read in the data, we can use various functions to see the raw data, you know, although again, this can hide some stuff from you. So before you do stuff with PAMS data frames, you might wanna look at the raw data on the disk in a, in a text editor. Um, but you have to have a rough idea of, of the stuff that we have in the data system before you can work with it. And so info gives you, is one of the things you can do on a data frame that gives you some of the most basic information. Uh, in this case, uh, we can see all of the name features, all the name columns that we had uh, in our data um, frame. Most of these came out as, as numbers. We've got them as numeric data already. Um, so all these except one. And we already mentioned this one. I think I've mentioned this object before. So uh, when Pandas tries to read values from the data frame, it tries to figure out the, the best type. If everything looks like an integer, it'll be an integer type. Some things look like floating point numbers, uh, they'll be floats instead. If it can't figure out what it is, it's probably numeric, sorry, it's probably um, a string, it's probably character data. Uh, an object is what is used as kind of default. So really it just reads in the bytes, kind of like, like the, the characters of the string uh, into the data frame in this column here. Um, so anytime you see an object, you should probably suspect that that is a, it's either a string, like if this was an address field, it's just, it's not really a categorical uh, variable because if this was housing addresses, uh, if, if we were looking at individual houses, everyone would be unique. I mean, most likely no house would have the same house address, right? So that's not really categorical data versus this. So, uh, so, so something that's read in as a string is either going to have to be represented as a string, and it might not be too useful to use in machine learning because we have to convert everything to a number, or it could be a categorical variable, which this one is. In which case, there's just a limited number of strings that might have to convert into a category variable to use it um, in a machine learning algorithm. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you see that that's uh, the, the first question asked, okay, is that going to be something that's a string that I might not be able to use without some uh, more complex conversions, or is it categorical there, right? So uh, a basic thing you can ask is, what are all the uh, unique values in there, right? So here, there were um, um, one, two, three, four, there's, there's only like uh, five unique strings in here. Right, which implies it's a categorical variable. I've got five discrete things, so I could probably convert this into a numerical categorical variable and use that in my machine learning model if, if it proves useful. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to wrap up. So besides info, uh, um, you know, most of the rest of these are other things for, um, um, initial data exploration. So describe gives you some some basic. Describe only gives you information about numerical items. So anything that's a numerical value, you can give descriptions of uh, a rough description of its range, which is the first thing you want to know about numerical information. So uh, the number of items. So if anything's missing, the number of items will be different than the total number of items we know we have in the the, the um, data frame. Right, but you know, right. The basic thing is what the mean value is, um, what the standard deviation is, the minimum and maximum value in that range, and then we also get get quartiles here, twenty five percent, fifty percent quartile, and so on. Um, yeah, and another thing you can infer from this is, you know, these don't have any missing values, but uh, total bedroom seems to be missing some things. It doesn't have the same uh, count. Um, as we know is in this database. So, so, so some of the items in total bedrooms must be blank. Um, and um, I don't know, I, I thought there was more than one, but um, so we might do something about things that, that have missing values. Um, so since this is only information about numerical, we might ask, okay, is there anything missing from the categorical variable? 
So there's probably lots of ways to do this, but here's a quick way. So I can also um, uh, count up how many values we had in that feature, and it seems to match. So it looks like we're not missing any of those. Um, all right, and it is already 145. So um, uh, there's a few more things here, a, a few examples then of um, visualizing some stuff. I'll, I'll start with this next time. So here's a real quick one. So here again, we're using uh, a plotting function on the data plane. Uh, so if you have a histogram, it'll give a histogram of all the numerical data. So every feature that was uh, loaded as numerical, we get a histogram. So this is a useful first pass to see, okay, does stuff look like it's normally distributed? Or does it look like I've got a uh, bimodal variable? You know, so I've got data with more than one peak here, which, you know, it's not really uh, surprising for the latitude and longitude um, because I'll talk about why. But, um, um, and so, oh, and also that you can notice we've got something weird going on here, which is discussed in the textbook. So, you know, why do we got this, what looks like okay distribution, but then also we got something over here on the end, most likely because some, um, um, some range cutoff was done. So anything bigger than that value would just set at that value for the median age uh, and the median house value. So if you see something like that, that's one thing to suspect, right? So whoever, whoever gathered this data decided that uh, if the house value was bigger than 500,000, we just entered in as 500,000 plus. That's why we got these kind of anomalies here. Um, okay, so yeah, let's go ahead and uh, wrap it up for there. Um, there's, there's more even in this first one, but we'll we'll do this one and the other on Thursday uh, and maybe start talking about the assignment, although uh, I might wait until next week before I start talking. All right, that's it. Um, so um, I'll be over in my office as usual uh, from 2 to 3.15 if people have questions. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you on Thursday then.